ourselves to Thee. Hands, hearts, and hands in unity to reach our destiny. Ever conscious of the God, being proud of our As one people, one family, God bless our nation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special get together. I'm Ricardo Keynes Douglas, and I have been invited to host this event and it gives me great pleasure to be your host. This evening, we are connecting from Grenada, the beautiful Isle of Spice, to our brothers and sisters in the diaspora and beyond. This is brought to you by the New York chapter of the National Democratic Congress in collaboration with members of the diaspora. This evening, we will get to meet and know a little bit more about the new political leader of the National Democratic Congress. We want to welcome you all all the Grenadians in the diaspora and friends who are, you know, logged in from continent to continent and multiple time zones from around the world. Thank you for being here and taking the time to be part of all of this. This is also the first in a series of conversations designed for you, the viewer, to meet the new elected political leader for the NDC and to create an open channel, you know, of discussion and dialogue as we go forward in the future. We will also get a chance to learn more about the political leader's vision for the governance of Grenada and how that vision affects all of you in the diaspora. Once this party secures such a mandate from citizens like yourself, all will be moving along nicely. And at the end, we will take time you know, to answer some questions. And I know the winter is creeping in slowly in some of the places at where you are, you know, but I just know that the moment you think of Grenada, Caracol, and Petit Martinique, it's going to warm you up. So I hope you're all comfortable, relaxed, full of good energy, and ready to be part of a very exciting journey. Brothers and sisters of the diaspora and beyond, it gives me wonderful pleasure to introduce to you the new political leader of the National Democratic Congress, Mr. Deacon Mitchell. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Mitchell. How are you today? I am excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ricky, for having me. Thank you for agreeing to host this event. And I want to say a special, special good afternoon, good evening, good night, good morning because I believe in some parts of the diaspora it may be morning. And I look forward to the discussion and I look forward to the discourse with our friends, citizens, well-wishers and supporters in the diaspora. Now, you know you came onto the scene like a shooting star. <laughs> and you know for me, as, as we all know that a shooting star is good energy. Because the moment you see a shooting star, you make a wish. And most wishes are very positive, so that's a very, very good sign. So now that you are on the political scene in the world, a lot of people don't know who Deacon Mitchell is. All of a sudden, there's this guy called Deacon Mitchell. He's a lawyer, blah, 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 blah. And everybody wants to know. We know a little bit about you, your friends and stuff. But the people out there around the world would like to know a little bit more about you. So if you can just tell us a, like, where you're from and a little bit of your education. Sure. Uh, Deacon Mitchell grew up in St. David in a small street village known as P.T. Esperance. Uh, I grew up in a household that was headed by women, my grandmother, who thankfully is still alive today, my mother, my aunt, uh, my brothers, sisters, and several cousins. We grew up at a time when uh, village life was vibrant, active. We grew up at a time where you were able to walk to school, and I went to the St. David's RC school. Mm -hmm. So I walk to school on mornings, walk back home at lunch for lunch, and then walk back in for the afternoon sessions. Uh, the St. David's RC school is located very close to the Bellevue Plain Field or Bellevue Pasture, uh, along with the Bellevue Community Center. So I spent considerable periods of time 
in the afternoons playing football, playing cricket, uh, engaging in athletics, um, and just having fun as a young person uh, with my friends, uh, cousins, and colleagues in the, in the neighborhood. So PT Esperance in St. David holds a very, very special and dear place in, in my heart because that's where I formed my formative years. Right, right. Uh, after I moved on to Presentation College for my high school years, I lived uh, for a couple of years in Labrie as well, in St. George's, so I spent quite a bit of time in Labrie, and so Labrie is also a place that's quite fun for me. Presentation College, like every college boy, I think really and truly represented a, a signal period of my life. Uh, most of my lifelong friends come out of Presentation College, both those who were in class with me and those who were ahead and in some instances uh, behind me. And behind me because after I finished Presentation College, I went to TMI Show Community College. I did my A-levels there. And then I went back to teach at Presentation Brothers College. And so in teaching, there were some uh, young college students who in fact I went to school with. And in two years space of time, had the opportunity to come back and teach them. And so they were not just my students, but my colleagues as well. And they also became my friends. And I have some lifelong friends, uh, one of whom is involved in the NDC New York chapter today oh, okay. um, as, as part of that process. <laughs> and so education, and I highlight this because education has been the hallmark of uh, what has helped to transform my life. Education along with strong family values, and I think crucially, a sense of community, a sense of, of, of what the village does in raising myself and many of my cousins, many of my extended family and, and friends. And so for me, in a true sense, Grenada, the good parts of Grenada is reflected in our education system, it's reflected in our village life, in our community life, because it really does take our village and our communities to raise each of us. Mm. Yeah. You know, if I'm not mistaken, I think you studied economics, right? Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, when I was I'm just curious from economics to, uh, to law. To law. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I would say this. I, one of my favorite subjects in, in, in high school in particular was that of history. Mm. And in, in studying history, you, particularly Caribbean history, um, you recognize that the economy and plantation, the plantation economy that we inherited in the Caribbean, Essential, it was a very unique feature of uh, Caribbean society and Caribbean development. And so I was always curious as to how uh, e economics, uh, the study of resources, uh, influence mm -hmm. our lives. And so notwithstanding my love for history, when I did A-levels, you, know, you always have to choose. Right, right. Um, I think just instinctively, I was always a very good history student. And at the time, history clashed with economics. And so I pursued history uh, formally during the two-year period when I was at, at National College. Mm -hmm. But because I loved economics so much. I actually asked a private tutor after <laughs> I had completed my A-levels to, to help me with doing economics at A-levels. Right. So while teaching at Presentation Brothers College and while studying law, I also uh, pursued getting um, an A-level in economics. Uh, because I, will, I, I I'm, and even today, I'm still fascinated by how you allocate scarce resources right, to, meet, right. <laughs> to meet the needs um, of a society or the needs of a household or a village, as the case might be. Mm. So that is really what drove me to pursue studying economics. Um, it's still a subject I'm fascinated with, mm. uh, notwithstanding that I went on to, in fact, pursue law at the University of the West Indies. Uh, so in 2000, well, in 1998, I left Grenada, uh, went to Cable Campus, University of the West Indies, completed my law degree there. And then I journeyed to Trinidad and Tobago, where I studied. Uh, I passed the bar at the Hewitting Law School. And I returned to Grenada in 2002. And mm. since then, um, until recently, <laughs> I've been a practicing attorney at law in, mm. in Grenada. And a very successful one, too. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Um, a, a true Caribbean man, because you didn't go further than the Caribbean to get your degrees and stuff. That's fantastic. Now, what, what led you to become politically involved? Was it something that was just milling around in your head? You know, or you just woke up one day and you just had this revelation that something has to be done and I want to be part of it. No, I think my education and my love for history, um, my love for economics, meant I always had an interest in, in politics, mm -hmm. um, in sociology, in the history of our regions. And particularly when you study what I would call the modern history of the Caribbean, right. it is clear that we've had some remarkable citizens not just in politics, but in arts, in sports, in culture, who have really stood up to create the Caribbean civilization. And we have to face the reality that our civilization came out of essentially a very dark period, that of slavery, uh, 
colonization, dehumanization, dependency, uh, an inferiority complex, mm -hmm. racism. Right. Yet still, our ancestors fought all of this to forge a Caribbean society based on democracy, freedom, uh, respect for human rights, the respect for private property. And so when you read your history, it sometimes gives you chills because you recognize how much people have sacrificed to give us the life we, we have today. And so throughout my schooling, I would have been influenced by a number of teachers who really lit that flame in me to recognize that you cannot take the society you live in for, for granted. And particularly in Grenada's case, uh, when we look at some of the turbulent uh, modern history, you recognize the kinds of sacrifices that persons have made, including sacrificing their lives uh, so that we could in fact have a better society. So I was always uh, intrigued and interested in mm -hmm. um, public life. But as to what made me get involved directly, I think more and more as I reflected on what was taking place in our, in our society, I think we've gotten to a point where many persons are even afraid to just speak up. They are afraid to voice their opinions. They are afraid to associate, to assemble, uh, and to get involved. And to me, once that is the state of play, it leaves us in a dangerous situation where, in fact, the very things that are crucial to the growth and continued prosperity of a society or democracy right, yeah. is a threat. And so I recognized that I was in a unique position where I felt I could in fact get involved, I could make a contribution, and therefore it was important that I not just talk privately or be critical of others, mm -hmm. but that in fact you stand up and be counted and to begin th that process. Right. And that really was the motivating factor. Oh, great. Okay, I knew you, you, wanted, you just joined the NDC, but was it your intention to go for PL, for political leader? Was it? No, not at all. Um, in fact, when I joined the NDC, I think the sole goal I had was to encourage other persons to join. Okay. And I think by me joining, because it was, it was important to lead by example. Right, Encouraging right. persons to join a political party, if you are not joining yourself, seems almost hypocritical. Um, because most people view politics as a risky business. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in some cases, you know, that is what, unfortunately, our society has, has suggested, that if you get involved in politics, it's a bad thing, it's a dirty thing. And so you recognize the hesitancy and reluctance of well-meaning citizens to get involved. So for me, it was important to lead by example. And I felt that by joining uh, in an open manner, right. it will give me the credibility to encourage others to join. And that really was the first goal, to encourage other persons to join the organization, to assist with, with rebuilding the organization, with building capacity, and with beginning the process of, of, of commencing change within the organization. Mm -hmm. And that was really the motivating factor. Right. But I mean, I mean, there were so many other parties you could have joined. So I was just curious to know why did you choose the NDC? Right. I think two reasons. Um, the core values of the NDC mattered to me, and that was, was instrumental. Mm -hmm. Two, notwithstanding the, the many challenges the National Democratic Congress had gone through, the fact is the National Democratic Congress, in my view, at the time, represented one of only two op real options in terms of uh, national political organizations. And I stress national because you have a lot of other smaller political organizations, which in my view do not have any national relevance or national ambitions. Mm -hmm. And so I felt it was important that you had to assess which party best reflected your goals, mm -hmm. your views, uh, your, your values, um, and the National Democratic Congress best represented that. Second, I was clear in my mind that there was an opportunity to begin the process of changing the National Democratic Congress. And I'm not going to apologize for that, because I think we all have to recognize that change is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Growth, particularly, is important. And that the National Democratic Congress needed to grow uh, needed to improve and needed to change if it was to recapture the imagination and the hearts um, of, of Grenadians. Mm -hmm. And so when I joined and when I encouraged others to join, it was partly with that goal in, in mind. Um, as it relates to the other national uh, political organization, um, I think the, the record is clear <laughs> to see uh, that change is not something that has happened within that organization, um, certainly over the last three or so decades. And so if one was being purely objective um, and purely analytical, the probability of joining that organization and, and inspiring right. change, I think, was uh, next to zero, minus zero. <laughs> so from that perspective, just being objective, I, mm -hmm. I think it was quite clear that the only choice, really, was the National Democratic Congress. Okay, great. No, I mean, we'll be coming to the segment, end the segment, but I have to ask you a question. Being, a, being an artist and in the performing arts and outside in the diaspora, there are tons of you know, performers out there in Grenada. Um, I'd like to ask you, I'm going to show you this where do you think your vision, I want to know, for the performing arts in Grenada? How is it you think it's important for the nation? Well, 
I will start with value. Mm -hmm. You know, the performing arts adds dignity and value to us as human beings. Um, and we can't underestimate that. And so once you're building a civilization, the performing arts ought to be a critical part of that. Right. And we need to understand that for the psyche of our people, for the pride of our people, uh, for the creativity of our people. And that is what we have, our people. Mm -hmm. And I recall, I don't know if you remember this, but when I was in Cave Hill, the Barbados Associ the Grenada Association in Barbados had actually invited you to do uh, a play, I think, um, mm -hmm. or, or, or spoken word at one of the events they had. And I recall, and I was involved in, in the association at the time because I was in Cable, and I recall watching you perform and, in a sense, watching you transfix yeah. us in the, in the audience. And it, it really took you away from whatever stress, mm -hmm. whatever issues that were plaguing you at the time. And we have to recognize it just from that perspective, the value of the performing arts, um, the creative arts. But outside of that, we seem not to appreciate the vast economic opportunities that are available to us arising from the performing arts and the creative arts. And I think we therefore have to truly recognize that, yeah. expose our people to that, educate our people to that, and to create the policy and the legal framework mm -hmm. that would really support the performing arts as a central pillar of our economic activity right. in, in Grenada. And regrettably, I think over the last, perhaps in, in my, I almost feel 30 years of my life, I certainly felt as a child that the performing arts played a far more crucial role in the fabric and, and the life of Grenada in all forms, drama, dance, music. I'm um, certainly growing up in, in schools, the performing arts seem to have been a far more central right. part of our lives than it's, it is today. And just starting from there, I think we really have to transform that. And I can give you, I can give you several examples. You know, we didn't have a carnival uh, during COVID-19 uh, 2020, but to me, we lost the opportunity to, in fact, teach the technical aspects of, of carnival, mm -hmm. songwriting, right. learning music, right. uh, playing mass, you know, create, sorry, creating... Mm -hmm creating masks, creating costume. We could have used the opportunity, notwithstanding that there was no carnival, really to really That's begin right. teaching that process amongst our, our young persons, costume making. We can, we can go on and on. Teaching the history of our traditional masks, mm -hmm. what it means, mm -hmm. how do you make it. If we don't do those things, it, it goes back to this whole question of what, who we are as a people, what makes us different, how do we distinguish and identify ourselves. And if we, if we don't recognize that, that the performing arts, perhaps more than anything else, plays that central role in defining us, um, then we, we will really not be building the Grenadian, or for that matter, Caribbean civilization that right. we, we should be building. Excellent. Okay, I can guarantee the artists and performing arts yes. listening out there, they're going to be very happy. Another thing, we need a national theater. <laughs> so I'm just dropping all these little seeds. Absolutely. absolutely. performers yeah. in Grenada. No, and, and that's part of, <laughs> you know, and that's part of the discourse we need to have because yes. it's the, the persons who are most uh, primarily involved in any given sector should really be the ones driving the policy and influencing the policy. Right. Um, you know, the, the politicians ultimately should be reflecting that which the persons and the people want, not, not what you have in your own head as a politician. Um, and so as someone who's an icon and a cultural ambassador, it really behoves those who wish to make public policy for us to sit, listen, uh, and hear you and then implement the things that would really make the difference because you know what you're talking about and oftentimes right. we don't certainly when it comes to, to, to those areas. Yeah. So I, I certainly welcome um, advice, discussions, suggestions um, with all of our artists, all of our creative people. And I said not just those who actually perform but those who are involved in the technical and the production aspect of things as well because again, it's an opportunity for us to teach our young persons about careers uh, non-traditional right, careers right, that they yes. may not have thought yeah. about in terms of things like music producing, film, video, you know, the PRO of the National Democratic Congress, Mr. Romain, is, is very passionate about that. And that's one of the things we need to, to, to promote because he's a, a perfect example mm -hmm. um, of how you can become successful in those areas. Right. Well, Mr. Political Leader, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And congratulations once Thank you. again. And all the best in Thank the future. You. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Oil down is we thing. Nobody could copy that. That has been national dish. Grenada's national dish. This one pot delicacy embodies our heritage, character, friendliness, and joy. Each ingredient brings with it a story of its own. It's a melange of our tumultuous history, our passion as a people and the love for a little socialization. Watch now. No get-together is a good get-together without a pot of oil. What do you And rum. But that's our story for another time. A 
At the heart of this dish is breadfruit. Introduced to us by Captain William Bly, you could find a tree in every backyard. Along with breadfruit is fig. That's what we call green bananas. and grown provisions like yams, dashi, and whatnot. No, this is just my opinion, but you can't make oil long without meat. Some people do, and that's fine, but you must have some meat in there. Pigtail, chicken, a little salt beef, crab, or wild meat, like iguana, or even salt fish. No, with the salt fish, you have to soak it good, because you don't want to salt the pot. You must also try not to eat out all before you finish prep the other ingredients. That is problems. Now, the salt fish, originally cod, was meant as a cheap source of food for the slaves. But today, salt fish is Mr. Salt Fish. So put some respect on it. Anyways, dumplings must not be forgotten. Very important. You see, making dumplings is an art. Can't be too hard or too soft. Can't be too big or too small. It can't be too sweet or too salty. It must be just right. All you need is a little flour, salt, and water. That is how we like it. Now, to pack the pot. That is the real skill. You must artfully stack all these ingredients in your pot and cloak it in callaloo. Let it simmer slowly in a bath of coconut milk, turmeric, which was introduced to us by South Asian immigrants, curry and other seasonings. Why? Pure perfection. At Independence Time, you can find pots of oil long smoldering on an open fireside in every community. Look out for the savory aroma and people lining by the pot with their bowl, fig leaf or plate, whichever is your choice. This dish is Grenada's fingerprint. Each pot possesses its own unique flavor. You see all of them? That's a Grenadian thing. In due time, the polls will open and democracy will call on us to make a choice. A choice between prosperity and false promises. We all desperately crave change and progress, but progress favors the prepared. What does it mean to be prepared? It means to get registered. Voting is your right, but you can only take part in the process if you are registered. Registration is the first individual move you have to take if you want to contribute to the collective effort of national transformation. Registration is how you can ensure your voice is heard. Registration is a step in the right direction to bring benefits to all people. To experience meaningful change. Registration and voting is the only way to actualize our vision. Our vision of more jobs and opportunities. Our vision of better health and a robust agricultural sector. Our vision of prosperity and nation building. The ink we must use to rewrite our destiny. To start a new chapter in our nation's history. Is in the voters booth. And only the registered. And only the registered. And only the registered have access. Change begins with registration. Get registered today. To get registered, visit your parliamentary electoral office in your constituency. For assistance with registration, call 435-1817 or visit our website at www.bringthevote.com. Welcome back once again. Here we are with our political leader, Mr. Deacon Mitchell. But also, this evening is also a, to start a fundraising event, right? So we can get to connect with each other in the diaspora. So right now, I will say farewell to you and I'm gonna bring on the man of the hour who will get you out there to get excited to support the 
National Democratic Congress and the new political leader. So I say farewell and Merry Christmas. And good evening to one and all from a wonderfully sunny Grenada. The sun is just about going down and we want to bid you wherever you are, welcome to our life. Now, as George Brizan used to say, one, one cocoa will fill the basket. Fundraising is a fundamental part of any campaign because campaigns generate significant costs to ensure that every qualified voter is armed with information needed to make an informed choice going into the polls. This requires media campaigns that help to get the party's message out to every eligible voter in Grenada, Karakou, and Petit Martinique, and to the wider region and diaspora. This requires significant advertising, printing, mobilization, transportation, office spaces, etc. So the party relies on support from its members allies, partners, and friends to make this possible. Tonight, our political leader will stress how important the support of people like you are to the success of the National Democratic Congress and launch its official fundraising campaign, ensuring that people at home and abroad who are actively seeking change in how our beautiful trial and state is governed and managed going forward can support this effort by providing resources, through fundraising, it brings us closer to seeing the change that we may want by supporting the party of your choice. Throughout this evening's session, information on how you get involved will be displayed on the bottom screen, and I invite you to write it down and share it with friends and colleagues who may have missed located in the world. From Victoria in St. Mark to Victoria in Australia, you can donate to the organization, and it's only a click away. I will now have our political leader expand on why donations are important to the party. So, over to you, Brother Deacon Mitchell, this evening. Tell us why. Tell us why. So, thank you again, Randall. And again, let me express my thanks to all of you in the diaspora who are with us uh, this evening. So, political organizations in Greenville, like the National Democratic Congress, is a volunteer association. It is an association made up of volunteers in its entirety, concerned citizens who wish the best for our nation. And so in order to resource the organization, we in fact depend completely on contributions, donations, uh, the time, the effort, and the resources of our citizens at home and in the diaspora. And therefore, for the political organization to in fact function in, and meet its basic obligations, we are completely reliant on donations, we are completely reliant on fundraising activities, and we are completely reliant on the time, the resources, both material and human, of our citizens and our friends in the diaspora. So from a fundamental basis, in order for the organization to be resourced, we in fact need your help and your assistance in order to do so. Secondly, we really wish to transform the National Democratic Congress into an organization 
that, it mem that its members and its membership fund. And this is critical because we want to ensure that the policies of the National Democratic Congress, that the issues that the National Democratic Congress champions are issues that matter to us, the ordinary citizens of Grenada. And it is therefore critical that going forward, we are able to in fact finance our organization through the ordinary membership, the ordinary contributions, and the ordinary donations of our membership. And this is very important because we do not want to risk our political organizations being captured by one or two big donors or one or two unknown persons who may fund the political party and indirectly control its policies, its goals, and the issues that it holds important to it, which may not be those issues that the average Grenadian, both in the diaspora and in Grenada, finds important. And so we really want to be transparent and clear in how we go about raising funds. And that means raising funds through a forum like this, where we appeal to our citizens in the diaspora, we appeal to our friends in the diaspora, we appeal to our associates in the diaspora to help fund the National Democratic Congress. And we are not asking for massive or large donations. Of course, if, you, if you're able to do so, we would welcome it. But really, the aim is to initiate the process of grassroots funding of our political organization so that our political organization reflects the issues that are important to our citizens. Um, and while this is the first initiative by which we are doing so, we really do hope on a, on a monthly basis to ask citizens in the diaspora, to ask citizens in Grenada, to continue making monthly small contributions to the National Democratic Congress so that we can meet our obligations. There's also another important aspect that I want to highlight. Although we've had political institutions and organizations existing since independence, and in some cases before independence, many of these political organizations uh, concentrate their efforts around elections. And we want to be able to move beyond that. We want to be able to ensure that the political organizations are always active in our communities, always active in our societies, not just at election time. And in order to do so, we need to be able to maintain and staff constituency offices so that these constituency offices become the center point of our engagement with the communities. You know, we have many senior citizens, for example, who don't even have a place to go to on evenings or on weekends to sit on a park, to sit on a bench, uh, to play a game of cards, or to just socialize or have an ice cream. And we want to get to a point where our constituency branch offices are used for those purposes. Uh, we have uh, many citizens here who have graciously agreed to, uh, in some cases, uh, underwrite the cost of the constituency offices by discounting the rent. Uh, we want to be able to use those areas, not just for politicking or politics, but in fact to be a true part of our communities. Uh, so that at Christmas time, our kids can come and engage in social activities so that our youth can be trained in, in various aspects of political work, civil work, uh, social work, volunteer work. And in order to do so, we clearly need the resources. And as I said, the point is we want to be transparent in that process. And the best way to be transparent is to ensure that we get small contributions from as many concerned citizens in the diaspora and in Grenada as possible. So I really do want to encourage you uh, to use the link available to in fact donate to the National Democratic Congress. And so, brothers and sisters, you have heard it from our political leader. You must understand how important this is because democracy must be financed and it must be financed by the people who will benefit from that, from that, uh, from the democracy. Yes, and that is you, every citizen of Grenada. So to donate, you can go to www.ndcgrenada.org slash fundraiser. Let's repeat that to donate. Go to www.ndcgrenada.org slash fundraiser. So, diaspora. The diaspora is a word of Greek origin, meaning to sow over or scatter. Over the past decade or so, diaspora has become a term of self-identification among people who have migrated to other places some folks might never come back to the country of their birth, but they have retained their emotional, cultural, and spiritual links with their home country. And no matter what, that umbilical cord is never broken. There is a wealth of talent, resources, and skills in the diaspora that are eager to join the mission to serve their country. 
successful Grenadians who love their country and who are tired of their contributions being limited to just sending much needed items home. But they are now prepared to step forward and have their voices and votes counted in the movement towards change. The NDC's goal is to build a better nation and lay the infrastructure that will make it easier for returning nationals to be welcomed back. Welcomed back to a country where it's easier to do business, where we have better healthcare systems and provide avenues where skill sets can be shared with the next generation. Very important. And so we come to question time. PL, can you elaborate about your thoughts on how important the diaspora is to the country and what role they play in nation building? Thank you, Randall. Let me start first by, I think, expressing gratitude on my own behalf, on behalf of the National Democratic Congress to the diaspora for uh, making this event possible. Because the idea to host this event in the first place came from the diaspora. And I think that in and of itself is testimony to the value of the diaspora to us in Grenada and to the National Democratic Congress. But I want to identify something that I've observed, and I think it's critical for us to recognize that the relationship between the diaspora and the homeland must be a relationship that is mutually beneficial, both to the homeland and to the diaspora. We in Grenada have benefited over the, over the several decades from the diaspora contributing particularly in material items to Grenada. But I often hear the frustration of the diaspora uh, when they feel, and in many instances rightly so, that they are treated with scant regard, with scant respect, and that their contributions are not valued. And the National Democratic Congress wants to make it clear that under the National Democratic Congress administration, that type of approach, that type of policy will be reversed. Citizens of Grenada are citizens of Grenada regardless of where they live. And we also have to understand that when a citizen of Grenada migrates, oftentimes his sense of, of identity is more crucial to him than ever before. And therefore, he needs to ensure that he identifies more. And, and oftentimes, there's a common saying that the further away you are from Grenada, the more patriotic you are. Uh, because you then truly appreciate why it is important to have a cultural identity. And so the, the diaspora, oftentimes, as I said, is, is perhaps more patriotic, more keen to assist and to help in improving Grenada. And we need to recognize that. We need to appreciate that. And crucially, we need to make sure that our policies in Grenada support that and make it easy and efficient for the diaspora to help not just by sending money back, not just by sending barrels of stuff back, not just by sending health equipment and health assistance back, but by truly appreciating that our members in the diaspora are living in societies that are far more sophisticated, that are far more complex, and therefore we need to value their experience and their skill set in assisting us in Grenada in meeting the challenges of addressing the complex issues we face in this world. And given our limited size, um, you know, it's a common joke that there are more Grenadians in New York than there are Grenadians in, 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 in Grenada. Um, and I say it's a joke, but it's probably true. So we need to recognize that. And I think that's the starting point in truly appreciating the fact that wherever a Grenadian is, uh, he's a Grenadian and he should be treated as such. I, I then want to highlight the fact that we need to eliminate a lot of the bottlenecks uh, that members of the diaspora face when returning home to help and to ensure that they are not frustrated and leave and go back and, and oftentimes wonder why they even offered to help in the first place. Because almost 90% of the time, it is genuinely help. It is not a desire to benefit personally. It is not a desire to show anyone up in Grenada. It's a desire to help. And sometimes it may be cultural uh, clashes because, you know, perhaps in New York, we talk about the New York Minute and everything happens at a much faster pace and you come to Grenada and we are still in, in island time or island life. And so both, both, both sides would need to recognize that we have to acclimatize in those circumstances. But I think truly a lot of the bottlenecks that we place um, and which prevent the diaspora from truly helping has to be addressed and has to be eliminated as, as much as, as possible. But the third aspect that I really think it's important for us to appreciate is the knowledge, the skill set, and the experience and connections uh, that members of the diaspora have, which we need to truly help transform Grenada. And I want to make this point because I think if we examine our political history, we would understand how crucial the diaspora is to Grenada. So Eric Matthew Geary came back to Grenada after having lived outside of Grenada. Maurice Bishop, Bernard Code, and many of the uh, leadership 
of the PRGP and came back to Grenada after having lived in Grenada. Our incumbent prime minister came back to Grenada after having lived outside of Grenada. And that tells you something. It tells you that the exposure and the experience that you get from living outside of Grenada oftentimes creates the desire in you to lead. It creates and it gives you the experience and the skill set to be able to come back to Grenada to help transform, for better or for worse, Grenada. And that is critical for us to understand because if we are going to truly grow and develop, we have to be prepared to keep an open mind. We need the exposure. We need the skill set that is, that is required. And from that perspective alone, I think we need to be able to mine the skill sets, the talent, the experience of the diaspora to help us not just materially, but politically as well. Um, this, is, this is crucial. And to help us develop our political institutions so that they can bring the sort of stability and growth that we need within the diaspora. Related to that, and I've said this and I'm going to repeat it. Given the challenges we have with uh, limited resources in Grenada, I think we can certainly use the diaspora to staff a significant portion of our diplomatic and consular offices throughout the world. And I'm not just saying New York or the United States, I'm saying throughout the world, because there are Grenadians living throughout the world who are very successful. And I'm sure would welcome the opportunity to help and in many cases underwrite the cost for the state of these consular and diplomatic uh, offices. And so we should really be looking to Grenadians first, rather than non-Grenadians, I think, throughout the world, to he help us with our diplomatic and consular missions. Uh, because why? They would have that sense of natural patriotism. You're not buying it. You know, they are giving it because they are Grenadians first and foremost. Second, if they are successful, it means they are probably likely to underwrite or be willing to assist in underwriting the cost of, of, those issue, of, of these offices. Um, and the personnel associated with it. And so you don't have to run the risk of people saying that you're appointing con men or, or, or persons of questionable character to hold Grenadian passports and so on, because you are essentially asking Grenadians to do so. And I think just that alone, from a point of view of appreciation, I think will we'll encourage even more Grenadians in the diaspora to be prepared to help and serve Grenada, because it truly reflects that you're looking for genuine partnership. In the area of foreign direct investment, you know, we always talk about how important foreign direct investment is to Grenada. But if we pay careful attention, I think the diaspora is the biggest group when it relates to foreign direct investment in Grenada. It is Grenadians who live overseas who are going to come back and build in Grenada, who are going to be sending monies back to Grenada, who are sending vehicles, clothing. I mean, you, you, could, you could name it. And I think if we pay particular attention and, and really crunch the numbers on that, we would see that the diaspora as a group is perhaps the single biggest direct foreign investor in Grenada. And therefore, when we are looking to develop Grenada, to me, that is the group we should be looking to first uh, before we go looking for, for, for persons from, from other parts of the world. And it is only when we exhaust this, and I, and I just say, I don't think we will be able to exhaust it, uh, because there are many, many successful Grenadians throughout the length and breadth of the world. Um, and I think we give them the opportunity to invest in Grenada if we allow them to help us to create the kinds of products that persons can invest in in Grenada, I think we would uh, make a significant dent in ensuring that we can grow the pie in Grenada and in ensuring that we can correct some of the structural issues that we have, we, we have in, in, in Grenada. So those are just some of the areas that I think the, the diaspora can help in. I mean, they're, they're the obvious ones that they've done so traditionally, remittances. You know, um, to a large extent, I think Grenada has remained a stable society. Um, notwithstanding the high unemployment rates because uh, persons' lifestyle and livelihood are underwritten in many instances, entire households and perhaps a large percentage of villages uh, by Grenadians who walk through thick and thin in New York, in London, in Canada, you know, to assist uh, their, their cousins, their brothers, their sisters, their parents' home. And so it's incumbent upon us who are the benefactors of this to truly be appreciative of it and to truly uh, say thank you to the members of the diaspora. And it's important for us as a government, I think, to also recognize that um, and to continue policies uh, that would facilitate, for example, the easy remittances uh, that would facilitate our diaspora members reinvesting in Grenada and to create and identify projects that uh, the diaspora would be interested in. And, and I think that is part of the challenge we face here, where we do not, in fact, come with or identify areas or projects uh, that members of the diaspora can help with. And worse yet, when members of the diaspora do identify it, uh, they don't get the support that is required, whether it's support in, in, in concessions or support in sometimes just moral support or just public advocacy on, on, on their behalf. And I am personally aware you know, of, of many instances where members of the diaspora have come back to Grenada 
and I've invested sometimes to the tune of millions of dollars in projects here. Um, and for, for silly reasons, really, um, these projects are not as successful as they ought to be. And it pains me because it, you recognize that when that happens, you increase the risk that our, our citizens outside of Grenada may feel discouraged or disenchanted to get involved in, in Grenada. And so having witnessed firsthand uh, many of these instances, it's really incumbent upon us as citizens of Grenada and certainly the National Democratic Congress will lead in that in ensuring that we truly uh, turn the corner on how we view the diaspora and ensure that the diaspora is an integral part of nation building in Grenada. So, Randall, I know I've said a lot. Um, yep. You know, I, I, I hope members of the diaspora um, would forgive me if I talk too much. <laughs> no, but I mean, you have hit the nail on the head. You know, we, we, we tend to want to um, differentiate between our citizens and so, look, you are a citizen of Grenada um, and so entitled to all that Grenada can provide for you and yes. wherever you are. And usually, as you have said, those in the diaspora seem to love the place more <laughs> than we do. Yes. Um, so, so I want to say, um, yes, it's really important that you continue, you know, all of you out there viewing, that you continue to support Grenada and what it is we want to do. And so I wanted to remind you about how to donate. Yes? So, to donate the funds, go to ndcgrenada.org slash fundraiser. On this platform, you can send payments using PayPal or using your credit card. Checks in the USA can be made payable to the NDC New York chapter. That's NDC New York chapter. Mailed to P.O. Box 250703, Brooklyn, New York, 11225. I will repeat that. Checks in the USA can be made payable to NDC New York chapter, and they can be mailed to P.O. Box 250703, Brooklyn, New York, 11225. Checks in Grenada can be made payable to NDC and mailed it to P.O. Box 1109, Grand Dance, St. George. Checks in Grenada, make them payable to NDC, mailed it to P.O. Box 1109, Grand Dance, St. George. And we really have to continue to stress how important the diaspora is to the country and must never be taken for granted. You are important, and every small gesture towards nation building is of enormous value. And we really appreciate what you continue to do, what you have done in the past, and what you will continue to do in the future for this lovely isle we call home. So the new political leader and his team, family, party, is depending very much on, your, on you for your support. Um, at this juncture, we would have some questions from the diaspora. Yes, we have come to the moment where we will open the lines for questions. We will try and keep it nice and tight and to the point as time is of the essence. And we want to accommodate as many questions as possible. Now, we had a question from about, it, we were talking about theater, but I think that was answered already. So we want to move on to, we have had a question come in from Bernadine in Houston. Yes, I'm looking at the prompter here. Texas. So she's in Houston, Texas. Uh, Pierre, how would you ensure that women are visibly involved at the highest level in your administration? Right. So thank you. Uh, for that question from Houston, Texas, and it's, a, it's an important question. And I, I want to answer it in two parts. I think within the party, National Democratic Congress, on being elected as the party leader, one of the immediate goals I've set out is to ensure that each constituency branch in Grenada has a vibrant and active women's arm. And that is critical because we need to ensure that we are able to, to on a constituency basis, ensure that we get women to come through the organization and to serve at the highest level. Yeah. And I think that is important. Um, and from that point, we will then be able to move on to ensure that we get women to serve at the highest level 
uh, in an NDC administration. And that has to be a deliberate policy. It has to be a deliberate policy. Women dominate and lead most of our households. Uh, they care for our children. They oftentimes do not bring the level of egotism that men bring uh, to po public and political life. And so it is important that, in fact, we have women serving at the, at the highest level. And certainly under uh, an NEC administration led by, by me, we will ensure that we, we do so. So as part of the process of, of creating the change, as part of the process of encouraging uh, persons to get involved in public life, we are also deliberately targeting women in particular because we recognize uh, that our society cannot grow and develop without having women in policy-making decisions at the highest level. Yes, indeed. And, you know, women really have been playing a very, very important... You know, in every political organization in Grenada, um, the women are the ones who really get outside there and make things happen, yeah. you know, Deacon, from, from, I mean, you know, Gary's time right up. Yeah. Yes, and so we must find, we must be deliberate about getting them involved in the political process at the highest level. So thank you for that. We have another question from Kwesi in Los Angeles, California. So Kwesi asks, I have a huge student loan to be repaid. I believe I'm, a, I'm good in my field and would love to return home. However, there are no guarantees that I would find employment if I do. Apart from the love of country, what will your administration do to attract persons like me to return and participate in nation building? Right. So, Kwesi, thank you for that question. It's a very important question that I think plagues um, our society and, and how do we address it. And let me say this. Part of the challenge we face in Grenada is the lack of transparency in terms of understanding what are the skill set that we need in Grenada and where we can find that. So, Kwesi, I'm not so sure what your expertise is um, in California, but I think the starting point is we need to build a platform. Uh, the PRO of the party reminds me that we live in the information age, and therefore we, we need to be able to mine data. And that means we need to be able to tell our citizens outside of Grenada what are the areas that we need critical skills in or expertise in that we do not have, and be able to match that with the expertise in the diaspora so that we can then attract the right skill set to fill the vacant positions that we may have home. And that is, that is part of what we are, must be able to use the technology that is available to us to, to address. So we need to implement a deliberate policy that will in fact do that. Because we have critical shortages of skills in Grenada. And oftentimes they are filled by uh, non-Grenadians um, without Grenadians in the diaspora getting an opportunity to realize that there's an opportunity for this to, to take place. So that's one of the critical things that uh, we, we, we need to do. Um, but I will also expand on this as well. Nation building doesn't always involve coming to Grenada to build Grenada. Um, you can build Grenada regardless of where, where you are. And with the technology that is available to us now, Kwesi may very well be able to contribute to nation building in Grenada without having to come to Grenada physically. You know, so many of us work remotely now. And we should be able to, to use uh, the skill set of our citizens without requiring them to fly into Grenada physically. So it may very well be Kwesi that depending on what your expertise uh, is, uh, that we may be, may be able to allow you to assist us in Grenada or even work in Grenada without you having to fly to Grenada. And again, that would, would address some of the concerns you have in terms of your, your, your student loan and being able to pay that back because it may even allow you perhaps to do two jobs. Uh, given the time zones that we have between California and Grenada, it may very well be that you may be able to work in Grenada and work in California and allow you to pay off the student loan in, in, in double time. So we have to be creative, uh, we have to be innovative, but I think it's, it's crucial for us to start really using information because we're using the information age to help us with finding the right uh, mixes and matches for the challenges that we face. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, we have Michelle in Dallas, Texas. What do you think about the educational system in Grenada? What structure will your administration put in place to bring the educational system in line with the 21st century? Uh, Michelle, thank you for the question. I am to a large extent the product of the education system in Grenada. The challenge I think we currently face is whether the education system is producing more Deacon Mitchells or less. We can't all be lawyers or doctors or the traditional professionals. Um, and in a population of 100,000, in fact, we probably saturated with, with that sort of traditional professionals. The education system in Grenada needs retooling to, in fact, fo focus on what I just talked about, the information age. We really need to make a concerted effort 
to introduce uh, coding, programming, and the necessary digital skill set into our, into our schools. Um, and you know, deliberate action over the next five years could begin that process of transforming our education system in Grenada. Even if it means importing in the initial stage the skill set and the expertise to implement those programs. There are places like South Korea in which, you know, at three and four years old, in addition to English, the next mandatory subject is coding. And I think many of us recognize how South Korea has completely, in a sense, over the last 10, or 10 years or so, uh, been responsible for a significant portion of the products that we consume, whether it's the Samsung phones and all the Samsung line of products and so on. Now, you may say this is South Korea, so it can't happen to Grenada. But I beg to differ, because ultimately, it's the human resource that is important. So, so for an NDC administration, if we are going to begin the process of transformation, if we are going to begin the process of putting Grenada on the path to uh, deal with the challenges of the 21st century, it must start with the education system. And, and those are two areas that I've identified as, as critical. Uh, the creative economy is also another part. And so we need to pay attention. And uh, Ricardo earlier talked about uh, the performing arts. That's another area that we need to ensure that is actually formally taught in our schools, um, both the technique as well as encouraging our, our passion and to be supported uh, both in terms of physical infrastructure and in terms of personnel uh, to help train that aspect. There are other areas that we take for granted, and I've been uh, talking about this a lot. Basic life skills like swimming. You see, education is not just going and sitting in a classroom and having a teacher impart knowledge to you. We need to be able to instill in our, 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 our children, in our citizens, uh, life skills that will serve them well. You know, I've talked about the importance of swimming because we live on an island. Yes. Um, our, our territorial waters is 75 times that of our land. Right. Uh, and therefore, we have to appreciate uh, that our marine territory is larger and perhaps even more significant and more important to our overall development than even the land on which we, yep. we live on. So again, having an education system that reflects that and that seeks to exploit that is important. And I always give this example. If you wanted to learn to fish in Grenada, how would you learn to fish? If your family uh, is not a family of fisher folk, yeah. Um, to a large extent, you're on your own, yeah. you know, because our education system has not viewed something like fishing as something that deserves the kind of attention to allow us to teach people how to fish. Um, and I don't think I need to, to, to stress the importance of fishing as an economic activity, Certainly. fishing as a recreational activity, um, because we have things like the Billfish Tournament, yes. uh, where, you know, persons from throughout the region come, and it's a, a major activity and a major economic activity in Grenada. So, so we have to take a practical view of what education is, and it is not certification. Mm -hmm. Yes, certification is important, and getting 10 and 15 subjects is important, but we need to teach life skills. Yeah. And we also need to critically teach our citizens to value themselves, yeah. to be confident in themselves, to be confident in who, who, who we are as a people, uh, to ensure that in the complex world that we, we live in, uh, that they can speak up, yeah. uh, be counted, and, and let people know that they stand for what is a Grenadian yeah. civilization. And that is critical in my mind if we are going to counteract some of the challenges that, you've, that we will face yeah. in, in, in the world, given that we live in an a, a age of uh, global information transfer. Yeah. You know, so, so those are some of the issues we need to address within the, the education system, not just the formal education system. But we can go on. Um, you know, how do we value our teachers? Yeah. I think we saw what happened with the whole issue of the 4%. Yeah. You know, um, and in my view, terribly wrong, this issue was, was handled. Our teachers don't just help our students to be certified. They spend a significant portion of their time with them. And so our teachers help to form the character of the character of our students and by extension the character of our nation. Yep. And so we need to recognize that. Mm -hmm. And it's not just monetary contributions. No. It's not just how much we pay our teachers, but how much we value and appreciate them. And so an NDC administration will ensure um, that that is reflected in how we treat with, speak to, and discuss uh, the changes that we need desperately to happen within our education system. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, you know, and, um, you know, we talk about education and it really is about the application of knowledge. Eh? It's about being able to function using the knowledge that you have gained wherever you have, you have gotten it to better your life. And, uh, and so we have another question from Natalie in uh, Sunrise, Florida. Her question, what are your plans to address the increasing interest of Chinese and other foreign interests in the social, economic, and political affairs of Grenada? Right. Uh, Natalie, thank you for the question. I, I think I can start off by saying that Grenada has always been a, an open society. Um, obviously, we were, we were colonized by the British. We gained our independence. 
uh, we had the intervention or invasion by the United States in 1983. We were occupied, uh, we had a peacekeeping force here um, for certainly up until 1985 when we had elections. And we've always been people that welcomes everyone. Um, Grenadians migrate quite a lot, hence the reason for an extensive diaspora. And so we have to recognize that uh, we are small and we're vulnerable. And so you would always have uh, various uh, global powers, um, partly because of our, our, our close proximity to the US, um, having an interest in Greenland and having an interest in, in the wider region. I think for us, what is important is that as Grenadians, we need to know what it is we want out of that relationship. I think our history has taught us that we do, do not need to fight the fight of the global powers. We do not need to get involved in the elephants fighting because you know what happens as the ants, <laughs> you're the one who's going to get trampled. So I think what has to happen is that we need to pursue, in my view, a non-aligned uh, approach to foreign relations. We need to pursue uh, an approach that says we're friends of all, uh, enemies of none, and we need to um, essentially not meddle in the affairs of others. Yep. Um, and we need to ensure that whatever relationship that we enter into and that we continue to, to promote amongst nations is one that is in the best interest of Grenada. And so that means putting Grenada first. first yes. And that is the approach that we will, we will take. Um, we need to ensure that whatever action we take, whatever foreign policy, um, whoever comes to invest in Grenada, that in fact we ensure that the investment deal is a deal that's in the best interest of Grenada. And I will say this, because that requires us as a nation to invest in persons who can negotiate, persons who want to negotiate, persons who recognize that you need to be able to sit with, with persons, um, talk, discuss, mediate uh, the best deal for Grenada. Too often, I think our government takes the approach of thinking because you're in power that you can do as you please. And the consequence of that is that the taxpayers and the citizens of Grenada have been left in many cases with holding uh, judgments against the people and state of Grenada for millions and millions yeah. of dollars, which we're still paying for. So I think it's absolutely crucial that when we engage in any sort of investment deals with uh, whether it's foreign entities, whether it's state or private, uh, that if we get to the point that there are issues or disputes arising over those matters, that we're able to sit down and negotiate. And if that fails, uh, that we defend Grenada's position as robustly as possible. Um, because I'm aware, in fact, that there have been serious instances where Grenada's position was just not defended, yep. where judgments and so on were entered against the state of Grenada because it was not defended. Um, and that, frankly, is criminal. Yep. You know, so we need to ensure uh, that we put the business of Grenada first. first. We need to ensure that we put uh, the citizens of Grenada first in all our dealings with any foreign uh, entity or foreign power. But I will repeat, uh, our history has taught us that we should not get involved in the fights or the squabbles yep. of the elephants. Um, and we should really seek to protect ourselves, yes. and I said to be friends of all and enemies of none. none. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, we have another question. Ah, they're coming fast and furious. Yes. yes. Deborah in New York, uh, New Jersey. What is, you, <laughs> what is your party's idea for building resilient communities in Grenada? Right. Deborah, thank you. Um, that really is a. a topical and current issue, and I'm, I'm grateful for the question. We, I want to talk perhaps first about energy, energy use as well as climate change and our behavior on that. We need to recognize that the planet may not go anywhere, um, and with the ravages of climate change, it is mankind that is going to be impacted negatively by this. And so we have to begin the process of educating our population to realize that our behavior has a direct impact right. on our sustainability and our survivability and the resilience of our communities. And so I want to talk, for example, about the fact that we are building, we are constructing in low-lying areas. We are constructing in areas that are prone to flood. When we do that, it essentially is guaranteeing that these will not be resilient yep. communities. And so we have to be able to, to man up and to be firm that from a land use point of view and from a policy point of view, we cannot keep encouraging building in areas where we know it is likely to flood or where we know the sea is likely to come in because you would be essentially wasting and squandering millions and millions of resources. Right? It, it's a hard uh, cultural change to accept, but it's a change that we must accept because the sea or the, the river or the flooding isn't going to change course. Okay. Right? We're the ones who are going to yeah. have to be required to change course. So we really have to engage in a, a holistic 
look at our land use policy mm -hmm. to ensure that we start addressing some of those, yeah. those issues. That's one. Two, our waste management system is something we need to particularly pay attention to. Um, we, we've taken baby steps in terms of, for example, banning the use of uh, plastic bags, single-use plastic bags. But we have to appreciate, for example, that the use of plastic bottles um, is widespread. You know, and again, these require open and frank discussions because it has economic implications. Yeah. But those are some of the issues that we need to address. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our waste management system, the, the level of plastic that we use in our communities, the level of waste that we use in our communities, uh, recycling. Yeah. You know, I was in, in Kairaku uh, earlier this week and I was happy to see that in Kairaku you have uh, garbage disposal bins that are clearly now identifying plastic use, uh, compost use, recyclable use. Little things like that, we need to be able to start within our schools, uh, within our villages, uh, to ensure that we, we engage upon that. Critically, we need to, in a very serious and targeted way, start reducing our use of uh, hydrocarbons, yeah. right? And we need to promote the use of renewable energies, mm -hmm. not just stock it, yeah. but actually ensure that our policies reflect that, right? Because it will immediately clean up our environment. I think we can talk about how nice and, and clean the air felt when we had these massive periods of lockdowns as a result of COVID-19. But I think we, we, we can't have a virus forcing us to breathe clean air. What we really need to do is begin uh, a, a policy direction that will allow us to start building re resilient communities. And it involves everything from the amount of vehicles on our roads um, to the question of how much renewable and solar energy and wind energy we, we use. And so even from a, a, a land building and, and building of properties point of view, uh, we need to start have planning legislation, for example, that will mandate, for example, uh, that we start going green with our energy yeah. consumption. We need to have planning laws that mandate that water storage capacity, tanks, cisterns. We can learn from our friends in Kairiko and PT Martin. The use of cisterns so that we have our own water storage becomes more and more important because we have to recognize we live in the hurricane belt. Yeah. Hurricanes are a threat every year, right? So we, we need our citizens to understand, therefore, if you are building a new house, not only must you build a standard that is hurricane resistant, but you need to put yourself in a position where for the, the month or the two months after the hurricane, when you have no water supply, for example, that in fact you have your own water. Yeah. And the best way to do that is to ensure that you construct your house with a tank. Yeah. You know, so those are some of the simple things we could do to start making ourselves um, more, more resilient in, in, in terms of some of the macro issues. But you know, we have a lot of work to do in that area, a lot of education to do in that area. And then finally, we need to, given that we as small islands did not really create uh, the challenges of, of climate change, we need to ensure that we advocate collectively to uh, hold the wealthier and larger nations responsible yes. and, and to ensure that they do the right thing yeah. in terms of reducing the use of uh, hydrocarbons and in terms of investing in uh, renewable technologies. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, at this juncture, we'll take a quick break and we will be right back with you. Um, continue to send those little dollars in, brothers and sisters. Send them in, send them in. And we are over to Master Control. See you shortly. In due time, the polls will open and democracy 
will call on us to make a choice. A choice between prosperity and false promises. We all desperately crave change and progress, but progress favors the prepared. What does it mean to be prepared? It means to get registered. Voting is your right, but you can only take part in the process if you are registered. Registration is the first individual move you have to take if you want to contribute to the collective effort of national transformation. Registration is how you can ensure your voice is heard. Registration is a step in the right direction to bring benefits to all people. To experience meaningful change. Registration and voting is the only way to actualize our vision. Our vision of more jobs and opportunities. Our vision of better health and a robust agricultural sector. Our vision of prosperity and nation building. The ink we must use to rewrite our destiny. To start a new chapter in our nation's history. Is in the voters booth. And only the registered. And only the registered. And only the registered have access. Change begins with registration. Get registered today. To get registered, visit your parliamentary electoral office in your constituency. For assistance with registration, call 435-1817 or visit our website at www.bringthevote.com. Well, folks, we are back with you. And let me tell you, you all are overwhelming us with these questions, man. They're coming in fast and furious. Now, time will not permit us to be able to answer all of them this evening, but we are taking note so that when we are doing a donate to, yeah, we'll get to answer some of them there. But of course, we, over the next few weeks and months, we will be engaging with you all the time. So we will be, you know, referring to the and answering them for, for you. Um, before we continue with, the, with um, Dennis in Atlanta, let me just remind you, ndcgrenada.org slash fundraiser on this platform and you can send payments using PayPal or using your credit card. Made NDC New York chapter, mail to... 0703 Brooklyn, New York 11225 and checks in Grenada can be made payable to NDC and box 1109 Grand Dance, St. George so please remember that and we go back to the prompter and we have Dennis Dennis, thank you for your question Dennis is in Atlanta, Georgia so he asks Economic growth must be inclusive to provide sustainable jobs and promote equality. How would an NDC government achieve these objectives? Okay. Thank you, Dennis. The, an NDC government will achieve these objectives by ensuring that the economic sectors that we drive and encourage for economic growth, in fact, uh, encapsulate the vast majority of Grenadians. And that is why we think the productive sector is really the areas that we need to concentrate on. Uh, we have the traditional sectors that are productive, like agriculture, agro-processing, which we feel have not been given sufficient attention over the last two decades. Uh, we have fishing, we have the marine sector, boating, yachting, the tourism sector. Um, and we go back to the creative economy, we go back to the digital economy. Grenada, I would put it this way, mainland Grenada, including Piti Matik and Kayak, who is not more than 110,000 people. Um, and if you factor in the size of our public service as well, and you recognize then uh, that if we encourage growth within the productive sectors that I've just uh, talked about, then we would be in a position to ensure that we have inclusive growth that is sustained uh, and that benefits all citizens of Grenada. Yeah, thank you very much. Indeed, um, I'm sure, Dennis, that you are happy with that answer. Uh, we move on to Sam in London. Uh, in what ways do you envisage the elderly can help to strengthen economic growth and development? Well, that's a very interesting question, uh, Sam. Thank you for that question. Well, th the first thing we need to ensure in Grenada is that our elderly are not actually plunged into poverty. Uh, we have a challenge in Grenada where, you know, public servants, um, you may be aware Sam has been clamoring to ensure that they are paid adequate pensions on retirement. But it's not just public servants who have to address the question of, of pensions. It's all of the working class of, of, of Grenada. 
and so social security from a pension point of view uh, social security reform is something we need to address directly in Grenada. Yeah. so that's the starting point we need to ensure that we build a society that doesn't in fact plunge our elderly into into poverty yeah. but crucially um many of our elderly are in fact successful yeah. uh, many of our elderly are in fact wealthy and so we can certainly learn from their examples in terms of what made them wealthy what made them successful uh, so that they can pass on their, yeah. their their stories to the next generation so that we can learn from them and then thirdly uh, i think our elderly um, can in fact help us to invest yeah. Yeah. you know and and we go back to questions like the use of our pension funds and what do we to invest in. Yeah. So that is, is crucial yeah. uh, as part of our uh, economic development going forward. We really do need to use our pension funds, our social security funds to invest in creating more employment yeah. so that in fact we can maintain and sustain our, our elderly. But for our elderly who are wealthy, uh, who are well off, we certainly need to learn from them um, in terms of having the knowledge transfer. And we certainly need to encourage them if they can to share their experiences, uh, to share their wealth with the next generation of Grenadians um, so that they could, in fact, aspire to be like uh, those members of our elderly class that, that are, uh, are wealthy. Yep. And thank you very much. For, um, I know that you are passionate about the elderly. You know, and, uh, you know, the other thing is that, um, Deacon, as we look, once we strengthen our health systems, it helps the elderly big time. Big Absolutely. time. Absolutely. You know, it impacts their, their, their pockets, you know, positively because we know what happens. Yeah. And, um, if, you know, the price of medication and all of that. And if we really boost up that health system, we may be able to subsidize that and cause them not to be worried so much. Yeah. Here's another question um, from New York. What is your position on the value of Caribbean integration? Are you satisfied with the accomplishments of the OECS and CARICOM? Yes. Uh, I will take the second part of the question first. And in, in simple, straightforward terms, no, I am not satisfied with the level of integration within the OECS and, and certainly at CARICOM level. In many re respects, we've rarely regressed. Uh, there's, there's not a way to, to, to look at it. And we could just talk about the lack of transportation yeah. Yeah. and the lack of air travel within the OECS and within the wider CARICOM. I mean, it's honestly shameful. Our four parents did a far better job uh, than, than we have done uh, in recent times. I mean, you have a couple, it's almost non existent. You know, so we really need to, to relook the lack of integration. We really need to ask ourselves why is that happening? And is it because of insularity, uh, short sightedness? Do we genuinely believe that as small pockets of, of, of people within the Caribbean, that we can on our own? Uh, continue to, to navigate the significant challenges we face as nations. When you look at the things that we've been successful at and the, the things that has brought us stability, if we take the OECS, for example, we've got a single currency. Yeah. We've got the same judicial system. You know, we've got the OECS secretary at the desk. Uh, we've been able to pull our resources in some instances when it comes to uh, uh, healthcare in terms of uh, uh, bulk, yeah. bulk uh, purchasing of, of pharmaceuticals and so on. So it, it begs the question, if these are obvious examples of how we've been successful, why are we not pushing for more of it yep. rather than less of it? You know? And again, it goes back perhaps to the fact that our political system um, is so entrenched where we encourage insularity and parochialism um, you know, that we need perhaps a generation change within the OECS mm -hmm. politically yep. to ensure that we can continue to foster um, economic integration, social and, and people integration amongst the OECS and, and, and CARICOM. And so unquestionably, it's been disappointing, um, the slow pace. But nation building is not instant coffee. Um, sometimes you start, you stop, and you have to start again. And certainly, um, as a citizen of the OECS and as a citizen of CARICOM, I certainly intend to champion um, and advocate for closer integration amongst the region. And not just talk about it, but to ensure that we begin putting policy and infrastructure in place that will encourage that. Because if we are not traveling amongst the region, if we are not getting to know one another, it becomes far easier for us to, to turn our eyes and turn our backs mm -hmm. on one another and to put us in a position where um, we weaken rather than strengthen ourselves. And there, there are countless examples that I can give. Let's take our security forces, our police forces, for example. There's nothing preventing us from having a regional no. uh, police machinery so that it allows for persons to, to, to work uh, within the police uh, force regionally throughout the regions rather than just in, in, in right. Grenada. The same way we have a single chief justice for the OECS. We could have a single commission of police for the OECS. You know, we can have a single police force and regional security system for the OECS, um, which in my view allows for, for a more merit-based 
um, system, of, system of security and for greater transfer of skills and, and knowledge and for less nepotism. Yeah. Uh, you know, because <laughs> if you're from Grenada, for example, and you're working in Antigua or St. Vincent and so on, then you don't have to worry that it's perhaps your family and that sort of thing. So I think there are examples of, of, of that we can explore mm -hmm. um, and, and pursue. And sport is another obvious yeah. example uh, that we can look at. So certainly, I think it's been disappointing um, over the last two decades, and we need to really reignite the, the flame of uh, OECS integration. Well, you know, interestingly, that, that question came forward, and, and um, I'm a Federation baby, right? Because my parents met, um, my father is Grenadian, my mother is Trinidadian, and they met when he went to federal, you know, and she was working with the federal government, and so they met and got married, and, and here I am the Federation baby. And I mean, we really have reg regressed from 1961 going right back. And to think that we have a, a university that um, encompasses all of us, you know, and, um, and, and here it is, this, all this insularity is taking yes, place, so it, it's really unfortunate, and it needs to be fixed, so I'm glad that your, your eye is on that ball. We have another question, New York again, what specifically would you and an NDC administration do to upgrade infrastructure and services in the delivery of healthcare, education, and the skills training in Grenada, Caraco, and Petit Pantique? All right, uh, New York, thank you for the question. And I will start with P.T. Martinique first. As I said, I just came from uh, Kaiko and P.T. Martinique earlier in the week. And P.T. Martinique is lacking basic infrastructure needed for a civilized island. And it's shameful. The jetty that the public uses, and I'm saying the public, the citizens of P.T. Martinique and Kaiko, is completely falling apart. That's unacceptable. The healthcare center is leaking and these are not complex issues to fix that is completely unacceptable the citizens of pt martin have pointed out to me that the dentist only comes to extract teeth they lack basic equipment for cleaning and that's shameful i, I want to um, shout out the canadian diaspora uh, because in 2019 and i think in 2018 you know a group of uh, Grenadians and other OECS and CARICOM citizens, uh, part of the Canadian diaspora, uh, came to Grenada during the summer and devoted their time, their effort, their resources to uh, providing free dental care and dental treatment uh, to the citizens of Grenada in Guelph um, in 2018 and then to St. David in, in, in 2019. And it really was an eye-opener for me um, because it demonstrated, for example, how, how, how much help we need yeah. um, in our oral uh, yeah. and, and dental oh. health care. And I, I point these things out, um, going back to PT Martin, but because this is basic infrastructure that simply requires, frankly, a budgetary allocation and the execution of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm saying the National Democratic Congress and the citizens of Piti Martin and, and Karik, when we will certainly advocate on their behalf, deserve better. Right. And so it's our job, even now, before we get into office, to start advocating for and on their behalf when it comes to those issues. If we take Karik, for instance, you know, you've got the princess, uh, you, you've got the hospital in, in, in Karik. Um, again, you have basic challenges where the hospital uh, is not functioning at the level it has to function, and it's compounded by the fact that you do not have regular travel between Grenada, Karakou, and Piti Martinique. And so we've had our citizens in Karakou, um, unfortunately, uh, die because they could not uh, get efficient uh, transportation to travel between Piti Martinique and Karakou. So we absolutely have to ensure that we are able to invest in the basic infrastructural needs of our citizens. I highlighted Piti Martin and Kaiko because to me they are obvious low-hanging issues that we can address. You can't have a situation where our citizens of Kaiko have to charter a private boat or charter a private plane to fly between Kaiko and, and Grenada to deal with their, 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 their loved ones. That is simply not acceptable. So an NDC administration will ensure that we put the resources in place to ensure that basic infrastructure is available in Piti Martin, in Kaiko, to address healthcare in particular. The same thing applies to skills training in Kaiku and PT Matic. You are at a marked disadvantage if you have to move from Kaiku to Grenada to learn carpentry, mm -hmm. to learn masonry, to learn uh, air conditioned refrigeration, any of those kinds of things. So we need to ensure that those services are available in at least in Kaiku. Cool. Yeah. Right? So that the citizens of PT Matic and Kaiku can, can help. But crucially, we have the opportunity to make Kaiku and PT Matic the hub of the Grenadines if we invest in those, those issues so that all the surrounding islands and the citizens of the surrounding islands can come to Kaiku and Piti Martin and create the kind of educational uh, center that you could, you could convert Piti Martin and Kaiku in. And crucially, we have to, to exploit and develop 
the things that CARICO and PT Martinique, I think, that have a competitive advantage in. Yes. Boat building, yes. fishing, you know, renewable energy. PT Martinique could clearly be a small island that is run completely on renewable energy. So those are some of the things we intend to promote and address in a very direct and specific way in terms of PT Martinique and CARICO. I will just give one example in terms of Grenada when we talk about skills, skills and education. I've been on record and I've indicated that we will establish on a parish basis mm -hmm. a skills training center in each parish in Grenada. Yeah. This is not novel no. uh, because when I was four or five years old, literally two houses from where I lived on the corner was the, the skills training center. Yeah. Uh, the property had belonged to the Anglican Church and had been given to the government of Grenada to specifically teach skills training. Uh, and, and people learned auto mechanic repair, sewing, carpentry, you know, mason work, all of it. The building has virtually disappeared. Yeah. Um, you know, and there are many instances of, of that. The land is still there, and I'm sure the Anglican Church uh, would probably be happy to, 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 to donate the land to the people of Green again if you were going to rebuild back a skills training center. And we take those things for granted. Did, yeah. But as I said, the 50 or 60 of us who graduate from a class in high school, it's only 10 of us who are going to become professionals. Yeah. You know, it's only 10 of us who may have the opportunity to migrate and go into the diaspora. What happens to the other 40 of us? Yeah. You know, what is the skill set that we are learning? How are we getting ready for the place of work? How are we getting ready to take care of ourselves? Some may go into a government job, some may get a job in an insurance or a bank. But what happens to the rest of us? We need to be prepared to ensure that we don't descend into, into poverty. And those are some of the basic things that we can address. And, and crucially, we can find out what is required in the labor market. Yeah. It's a small place. We can do the surveys. We can do the data mining to say Grenada will need, for example, 50 or 60 wellers in the next four to five years based on the construction activity or the, the construction levels or the planned hotels or the plan, what have you, right? And, and work back from that. We can say, for example, if the average age of our fishermen are 50 or 60, then we should know that in 10 or 15 years, we will need to be able to replenish. And therefore, we need to be able to train our fishermen. Those things, to me, <laughs> don't seem that complex. It doesn't seem to be rocket science. Um, and huge countries do that, model that, because you know you need to be able to ensure that your, 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 your labor force can, in fact, match what is required in the, uh, yep. in the labor market. Um, and so I want to thank New York for the question. Um, I might have gone on a bit. That's all right. But I think it's, it's important, and I'm passionate about that, because I really do feel we've let ourselves down um, by not paying attention to some of those issues. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, you're right on point. And so we have Cynthia. Purcell Fraser from Georgia. The high level of unemployment and underemployment among the youthful population is a cause for major concern. Many are feeling hopeless after being bamboozled with false promises. My question is, what are some of the measures you are planning to implement in order to alleviate the feeling of hopelessness among young people? Right. Cynthia, thank you for the question. I want to start now with some of the things the National Democratic Congress is already championing. We need to, right now, encourage your young people to start thinking about alternative means of employment. And I'm saying alternative as in not the traditional means. Yeah. And I, I therefore want to stress the digital economy. Yeah. I was speaking to one of the members of the UTAM, of the National Democratic Congress, on Saturday. And we were discussing a program where we are going to seek to get five persons from each constituency, youth, to embark, so that will essentially get us to 50, to 75 persons, uh, to embark upon a course so that they can learn uh, programming and coding. Yeah. Uh, the plan is essentially to, to, to write up a proposal uh, that we can take to, to sponsors, uh, to well-wishers, and to persons who are prepared to help. Yeah. The cost of, of, of the program is essentially $2,000. Right. Uh, so if you do uh, 2000 by 15, then you know what, uh, what we need. Yeah. Right? And essentially, the plan there is to get these young people to uh, do coding, to do programming, because we are satisfied mm -hmm. that just from learning that skill set, they will put themselves in a position where they could begin to earn sustained yeah. income, mm -hmm. and in many instances, far higher than uh, many of the traditional jobs in Grenada, yeah. almost immediately. Okay. The question is, why are we not talking publicly about those opportunities and those jobs? And, and, and the alternative uh, forms of employment that are available. We need to bring those things to the attention of our young pers persons. We need to educate them about them, and we need to train them mm -hmm. so that they could understand that it puts you in a position where you become a global worker. Yeah. Because when you're doing coding and programming, it is not for Grenada, it is for the globe, right? And so you recognize that you become a citizen of the world because you develop a skill set that allows you to work 
You may stay in Greenland if you wish, but it allows you to work from almost anywhere in the world. You know, I met a gentleman from South Africa who came into my office and he said, well, you know, essentially he's a programmer. He bought a boat and he literally lives on the boat and he sails around the world. Um, so I said, so where do you work? He's like, I work on my boat. And I'm like, what do you do? He's like, I'm a programmer. And he says, but the bulk of my money, for example, is paid in the US. And I like Grenada and I'm thinking about settling in. I was, he wanted some tax advice as to whether he'd be taxed in the US and, and so on. Now, I was fascinated by this story because it truly tells you that with the appropriate skill set, you really do become a citizen of the globe. And Grenada is a wonderful place to live in. And so you can, you can work almost anywhere in the world but be stationed in Grenada once you have the appropriate skill set. So the hope and the message to our youth is just that. Yeah. With the right education, with the right skill set, you become a global player. Educated in Grenada, you may choose to live in Grenada or not, but the point is you are competing on a global level and you will succeed. And your, your remuneration, your benefits will reflect the fact that you're a global citizen. And that is the kind of hope we need to bring to our young people. That is the kind of uh, energy and hope and enthusiasm we need to say to them that with the right skill set, with the right training, which we will deliver to you, you truly will be successful in Grenada and anywhere else that you, you, you wish to work. But, and that is fantastic because we are investing in our young people. Yeah. We are giving them that, um, that, that fishing rod, you know, we're not giving them a fish. And so, um, brothers and sisters, we have come to the last question that we can take at this juncture. And it comes from Callan from London in the United Kingdom. I bring you warm and fraternal greetings from the United Kingdom, home of many Grenadians yearning for a positive change to our beloved homeland. We in the UK recognize the youths in Grenada were woefully misled with false promises. Today, they are forgotten and there is no hope under your leadership. What can the youths of Grenada expect in the short, medium and the long term? This also relates to youths in the diaspora who want to contribute to the progressive development of Grenada, Karakou, and Petit Martinique. As political leader, what are your final thoughts about the mission of the NDC and how your party is going to build a better tri-island state? All right. Thank you for the question. Um, I think I, I want to start by emphasizing that the, the diaspora and the youth in the diaspora are critical to Grenada as well. And so when I speak here, it is not just to inspire hope in Grenadians uh, and young people in Grenada, but also young people in the diaspora, young people in the, in the Caribbean. Because our islands, our civilization belongs to us. And I think if we read our history, we would recognize that oftentimes it is young people that drives change and transformation. And so we need to encourage our young people to become active in public life, to become active in social life, uh, because oftentimes you are the ones who will drive the change that our society so desperately need. So under the National Democratic Congress and under my leadership, I certainly intend to champion uh, the involvement of young people in all aspects of our, our lives. And I intend to advocate and champion on their behalf because the future belongs to them. Yeah. And I've been on record as saying that the future starts now. And if we don't begin the process of change now, we will lose that future. And we certainly do not want that. Um, and so. You know, for the members of the diaspora who, who are listening to me, part of the reason for us having this and asking for donations, asking for contributions, is really for us to show to the next generation of Grenadians that we care about them, yeah. that we want to embark upon the change that will enhance their lives, yes. that will improve their lives, that will give them the sense of hope uh, that they so desperately need to know that your station in life is not poverty. Yeah that your station in life is not dependency, that you're, you truly rightfully belong to the world. Uh, you deserve to be treated with respect. You deserve to be encouraged. You deserve to be helped so that you could blossom into the full potential that all of us as citizens of Grenada uh, deserve. So to the members of the diaspora, I certainly want to encourage you to continue donating uh, and championing the cause of the National Democratic Congress. Uh, we will be having more fundraisers. The hope is that we can get sufficient members, both in the diaspora and in Grenada, to fund the National Democratic Congress as part of this grassroots movement um, on a continuous basis, as I said, not just around election times, because we want to put the party in a position where we can continue the sort of initiatives that I talked about, where we can find 75 youth and train yeah. them in, in coding yeah. or programming so that they can go on uh, to live sustained and meaningful lives, and so in turn, they can help 
other members of the society and talk about their experiences and talk about the fact that it was the National Democratic Congress that gave them the opportunity yeah. and, the, and the chance so that we can replicate this throughout our communities. It may be coding, it may be in sport, it may be in, 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 in football, you know, whatever foundations that we can, we can use. Um, you know, in the diaspora, there are a lot of charitable organizations uh, that may be prepared to help donate and help persons, whether it's in the medical field, whether it's in the sporting field, whether it's in the education field. Uh, we want our members of the diaspora to remember that as well. It is not just financial. Uh, there are a lot of citizens of Grenada who are talented, but because of lack of resources, may not get the opportunity to pursue a higher education or to pursue a sports scholarship um, or any particular field of endeavor. And we would certainly want you to keep that in mind. And when you come across those kinds of uh, foundations or charitable trusts, to refer them to the National Democratic Congress so that we can identify Grenadian youth who would benefit from, from that. Well, thank you very much, PL. And let me say on behalf of all of us and those in the diaspora, um, it was really wonderful having you with us this evening. And um, let me shake your hand. I mean, I think, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's a pleasure. You've been doing pleasure. a brilliant job thank so you. far. Thank you very much. And uh, so before we go, brothers and sisters, we want to remind you to donate funds Go to the nbcgrenada.org slash fundraiser. On this platform, you can send payments using PayPal or using your credit card. Checks in the USA can be made payable to NBC New York chapter, and you can mail them to PO Box 250703, Brooklyn, New York, 11225. Checks in Grenada can be made payable to NBC and mailed to P.O. Box 1109, Grand Dance in George. So, to all of you who have been with us for the past, what is it, hour and three quarter, we want to say thank you very much to our technical team. Thank you very much. Um, to Ricky, who started off the program, thank you very much. And to all of you, brothers and sisters, in, especially in the diaspora, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for making it happen. Have a blessed one and see you soon. Merry Christmas. Of my beautiful name